Hi guys, we're out here at the Legends and we are asking people about the key virtues. Let's see what they say. A virtue? Yeah. You know what, no, I don't. No? No. I'm gonna say like a good quality. A good quality? Yeah. Your lipstick is killer. <laughs> I don't know what a virtue is. You don't know what a virtue is? Does anybody here know what a virtue is? Anyone? Like patience is a virtue. Yes. Like they're good yeah. qualities. Yes. What would you say your definition of love is? Giving all you can with what all you have. Give a song with the lyrics of love in it. Love to love you, baby. Oh! Love to love you, baby. Yes! Oh! Yes, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Hello, Westside Family Church. It is so great to see you here in the North Sanctuary, those of you in the South Sanctuary, those of you at our Speedway campus, those of you who are watching online, a shout out specifically to Mitch from Trinidad, Colorado. Let's give it up to Mitch and those who have joined us online. We're so excited that you have joined us. Um, well, listen to this. Uh, yesterday, uh, it was a year ago yesterday, that Roseanne and I packed up our car and took the 13-hour drive from San Antonio to Kansas City, and we want to thank you for receiving us and for your awesome Midwest hospitality, and I just want to let you know we're just beginning, baby. We're just beginning. Is it exciting? All right, speaking of beginnings, today we are going to begin the final leg of our journey through Believe. And we have come to my favorite section. It is on the 10 key virtues of the Christian life. Why uh, is it so important? Because the Bible teaches that who you are and who you become is the most important thing about you. Why? Because um, the reason it's so important is because who you are is key to where the story of God is going. You need to know that the story of God from the very beginning of humanity has been to restore what was lost through Adam and Eve. It was restored through Jesus Christ. And now God is seeking to build a new garden and a new kingdom where God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who we talked about in chapter one, is going to come down once again, make their primary residence in this new garden. And who else will be there? Those who have placed their faith in Christ in this life. And we will live together with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit forever and ever. Can I get an amen? amen. So uh, life in this new garden, in this kingdom of God, is all about relationships. It's all about how we treat one another. It's all about that. The fighting and the bickering, the jabs, the jealousy, the hatred, the elitism, the racism, all the other isms have no place in the kingdom of God, in the garden of God. No place. Wouldn't that be something? to not have all the junk that we experience in this life, in the life to come. Well, that is the vision of God. The, 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 the spiritual growth journey, then, is just that. It is a journey of becoming the kind of person that is fit for the new garden. That's the journey. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the Apostle Paul tells us, that God has predestined, even before we were born, that we would be conformed into the image of Christ, who, by the way, beautifully and perfectly models the virtues of the Christian life for us. As we read through the Bible from the beginning to end, looking for a list, a tangible list of the virtues that God wants to see developed into our life, we land ourselves in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, contained in this two 
scriptures, two passages of scripture, two verses, is really one of the most complete list of all the virtues that you'll see unfold in the Bible. And so we've added hope and humility, and as a result, we've come up with the 10 key virtues of the Christian life. I want you to take a look at them here. Here they are, love, joy, peace, self-control, hope, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and humility. This makes up the vision of the kind of person God is wanting you to become. Now, I want you to notice that they're called the fruit of the Spirit. So I want you to envision yourself being a fruit tree, not a fruit cake, a fruit tree. And the purpose of a fruit tree, Jesus said, is to produce fruit. It is to produce fruit. But the purpose of the fruit is not for the sake of the tree. The purpose of the fruit is to provide nourishment for the sake of others. That is the purpose of the tree. So the Bible is basically drawing this analogy. When other people taste the fruit of your tree, what does it taste like? Is it green? meaning immature? Is it rotten, like bad to the core? Is it artificial, filled with inauthenticity? Or is the fruit that's produced on your tree ripe? God wants to produce ripe fruit at the end of your branches from the inside out so that you can provide great nourishment and pleasure to the people that God has placed in your life. This is life 24-7 in the new garden or the new kingdom. But listen to this, church. You don't have to wait till then to experience it. That's why it's called the fruit of the Spirit. It's interesting. Galatians 5.23 ends with this sort of odd statement after listing all of the fruit of the Spirit. It says, against such things there is no law. What does that mean? It means that this kind of virtue being developed in you cannot be done from the outside in. There is no law or legalism or legislation that can make you become this kind of person. But the power of the Holy Spirit within you, as you yield to the will of God, can actually little by little produce this within you. And sure enough, one day, boom, out comes a bud at the end of your life that people ultimately are going to be able to taste and oh, how sweet it is. So this is the vision that God has for the kind of person you will become. You interested? Are you interested? Yes. Are you really interested? Yes. Okay, let's pray. We'll dive into the first one. Father, we open up our hands and our hearts to you right now as we open up your word. And I invite you, Father, to let us receive everything you want us to receive. And Father, please don't let me get in the way of what your spirit wants to do today for those who are sitting right before me all the way to those who are watching online. We pray this in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said. Amen. Okay, for this first virtue, here is the goal. Here is the desired outcome. The notion of the idea, if we were to pool a people, a group of people that know you and ask them to describe who you are, not what you do, not what you believe. Those are important. We've already covered those, but who you are as they experience you, what we're looking for them to say, a word we're looking for them to refer to as it relates to who you are is the word love, love. Now, from a biblical perspective, love has two relational dimensions to them that are distinct. The first one is vertical, your relationship with God, and secondly, horizontal, your relationships with others. And this forms the key idea which we've invited you to memorize. I want you to say it out loud with me today. Right, church? Ready? I am committed to loving God and loving others. Committed to loving God and loving others. Now, when we study the concept of love in the Bible from Genesis to the maps, we see two dominant characteristics coming out of the word love, and not only the meaning of the words, but the stories in which they are encased in. The first one is the word sacrificial or sacrifice, meaning that this is going to cost me something. And secondly, the word unconditional, 
which means I am going to love you regardless of how you love me back. In the, in the New Testament particularly, they were looking for a way, the teachers of the New Testament were looking for a way to describe the sacrificial, unconditional love, and there just wasn't a word for love that existed in the Greek language. Maybe some of you have heard this before. The, there is the word philos, where we get the word Philadelphia, which refers to brotherly love, kind of a mutually beneficial love. And then there's the word eros, where we get the word erotic, which refers to romantic love. Neither one of those captures the concept of sacrificial and unconditional. So what the writers of the New Testament did is that they actually borrowed a word and over time, it came to refer to this brand of love. The word is agape. It's a brand new word that the New Testament writers create. And whenever you hear it, you're supposed to hear unconditional and sacrificial. Agape love, we just sang about it. It is a form of reckless love. It is reckless love. So I want you to see how you're doing. In the back of your program, we put uh, four uh, statements to give you an opportunity to evaluate yourself and where you're at in expressing agape love. These are four statements that years ago I developed uh, with a guy named uh, George Gallup. Now, before you look at those, here's the question we're going to ask and answer. How do I sacrificially and unconditionally love others. So let's see how you're doing. The first statement is, God's grace enables me to forgive people who have hurt me, okay? Doesn't apply at all or completely applies to me. No cheating, uh, make it your own answer and nobody looking at it, be honest, okay? The second statement is, I rejoice when good things happen to other people. Honestly, where are you at with that? Can you remember a time you jumped up and down when a coworker got the raise that you didn't? Uh-huh, maybe a two. I demonstrate love equally toward people of all races. Very important in scripture. And finally, the last statement is, I frequently give up what I want for the sake of others. Zero, doesn't apply at all. Five, completely applies. Now, if you're in a life group, and I certainly hope that you are, um, uh, to, to illustrate this concept of, of sacrificial and unconditional love, I looked at the relationship between Jonathan and David. There's so many things that are packed in this chapter, but uh, after praying, I decided that I would come back to this relationship and probe a little deeper because the relationship that Jonathan has toward David gives us such a beautiful picture of what this brand of reckless love is all about. Now, for those of you who are new to the scriptures, there are two characters, a guy named David and a guy named Jonathan. David, at the time of the story that we're encountering, is a young man. As a matter of fact, at the age of 16, a prophet named Samuel rolls into his town, and unbeknownst to him, before he knows it, he has oil pouring, pouring down from the top of his head, and Samuel says, God has called you to be the next king of Israel. Can you imagine that, 16 years old? But here's the deal. Uh, God is going to leave the current king in place, King Saul. He has been disqualified because of his persistent disobedience to God, but God is going to leave King Saul as king for the next 14 years in place for the express purpose of agitating and tracking Saul, uh, David down. That's what he's going to do. He's going to use his authority to track David down as a fugitive. Uh, why? Because David has the character to be a good king to represent God to Israel. But David's scope of experience has been with the small flock of smelly sheep he oversaw or shepherded for his dad. The scope of responsibility it takes to shepherd with integrity the flock of Israel well, that's going to take more refinement, more testing, and more training. And God is going to use Saul to actually provide these challenges for David so that David can grow up to be the kind of king that God has called him to be. David's going to go through the crucible, through the fire, to equip him for a call that is yet ahead of him. Right now, some of you are maybe going through a challenging time, a very difficult time. You might want to consider that God has you going through this time now to refine you, to test you, and to grow you up and prepare you for a calling yet ahead of you. So don't disdain it, but rather embrace it. 
Now, Jonathan is the son of King Saul, and what's most important, he is next in line to be the king of Israel. Now, the the next question becomes, how do David and Jonathan meet? David and Jonathan first meet on the battlefield. You may know the familiar, famous story where the Philistines are kicking the stuffing out of the Israelites. And on this day, on a battlefield, one of the Philistines, a giant by the name of Goliath, stands up and challenges Israel to pick one other soldier to fight him, and the winner will take all. And out of nowhere, young David emerges. No one saw it coming. And with a single stone from his slingshot, he takes down a nine-foot giant. And King Saul and Jonathan and everybody is watching and make the note that there is a special anointing on the life of this guy named David. And King Saul invites David to come live at his palace, and that is where Jonathan and David strike up a relationship with each other. And what we're going to notice in this relationship is that there are four things that Jonathan does for David that gives a beautiful picture, image, tangible idea of what sacrificial and unconditional love look like. We pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 18 at the beginning of their relationship. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. I want you to underline the word covenant. Jonathan made a covenant with him. If you desire to be a Jonathan in someone else's life, Here is what you need to do. Write this first principle down. I make a no-strings-attached covenant to love them. I make a no-strings-attached covenant to love them. There is a difference between a covenant and a contract. A contract is a mutually beneficial relationship. A covenant, on the other hand, is something that you fulfill regardless of what the other person does. Jonathan is saying to David, I am going to be there for you no matter what you do for me. Hmm. Our culture today doesn't understand this kind of sacrificial and unconditional love. When I was in Hong Kong just a week or so ago, I was in a gathering and they were showing a video and the narrator of the video uh, said, um, Hong Kong The divorce rate in Hong Kong is almost as high as the divorce rate in the United States. And you can hear a gasp within the audience basically saying, it can't possibly be that bad. I'm like, hey, I'm sitting right here. You know, uh, basically, we are known as a Christian country, but we are not known around the world for covenantal love. Folks, that has to change, and it has to begin with us. Marriage is a covenant, and that means it's not about what I get out of the relationship, and if I stop getting out of the relationship what I need, if I'm no longer happy, if you're no longer meeting my needs, then we're gonna break the contract. No, marriage is not, even though people say it, a 50-50 proposition. Marriage, from a biblical point of view, is I'm 100% in, and I just hope And pray that you will give something back as well. But if you don't, God is going to give me the strength to fulfill my covenantal promise to you. You know what that is, folks? That is stupid, crazy, reckless love. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, knowing what he did for you, you would not understand why anybody would be so would be so crazy to offer that kind of unconditional, sacrificial love to somebody else. And what a true blessing. It is in one's lifetime to be able to name maybe one, maybe two, at the tops, maybe three people who have made a covenant with us to love us like that. That, my friends, is true success. That, my friends, is true riches. Well, pretty quickly, as you know the story, Saul 
develops a jealousy of David, a jealousy that burns in his soul and turns up the fire of the evil spirit within him. And he is committed to bringing David down. On two occasions, as the story unfolds, Saul actually hurls spears at David to kill him, but he misses. So Saul gives an order to his men, which includes his son Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapter 19. Listen to this. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him. My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about, uh, about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? How does one sacrificially and unconditionally love another. Principle number two, write it down. I am their advocate. I am their advocate. An advocate is someone who stands up for you whether you are present or not. Stands up for you whether you're present or not. First John chapter two, verse one, tells us that Jesus is our advocate before the Father. He comes to our defense. The image or the picture is Satan is hurling uh, uh, insults about who we are, telling us that we're nobody, that we're not worthy, and Jesus steps in and says, I object. I beg to differ, and he defends us before the Father, even though we're not there. Jonathan warns David, but then has the courage when David is not present to stand up to his father and say, I object. I beg to differ. And he is the king of Israel. I don't know if you're fully aware of this or not, but when you're not present, there are groups of people that gossip about you. Did you know that? It's true. I hope it's not a news flash for you. You say, no, not, not me, because I'm a nice person. They'll gossip and trash talk you for being nice. I mean, it's just human nature for people to do this. When you are being trash talked, your Jonathan, if he or she is there, will not sit still, but will stand up and they will always speak up on your behalf and say, I object to what you are saying. I beg to differ with you. The times in my life when I have been hurt the deepest is not when people who don't know me or people who don't like me, yes, I've come to that place where I acknowledge that, I'm not sure how, but there are people who don't <laughs> like me. When I get hurt the most, it is when somebody who I thought entered into a Jonathan relationship with me, when word gets back to me that people were trash talking about me and they were there and they did not stand up for me. It hurts. But you wanna know what hurts even more? Is when I'm in the position of Jonathan and I fail to have the courage to speak up for somebody that I coveted to love and to say, I object. I beg to differ with you. Well, Saul backs down for just a little while, but it doesn't last long. He is bent on taking David out. And in one story as it unfolds, while David is playing the harp for him to calm his nerves, he decides to throw a third spear at him. And David, like a superhero, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, it misses him, and David uh, says to himself, I'm seeing a pattern here. <laughs> Saul's throwing a lot of so swords at me. Maybe it's time for me to get out of town. Good idea. David is now a fugitive, running for his life. Listen to this. He will run for his life over the next 14 years. 
years. Well, while David is running, Jonathan meets up with him out in a field. And I want you to listen to the dialogue found in 1 Samuel chapter 20. Then David fled to Naoth, uh, Naoth at Ramah, which, by the way, is where Samuel lived, and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied, you are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. But David took an oath and said, your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only one step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I will do for you. David was distraught, and rightfully so. As a matter of fact, I and several other people believe that because of this trauma in David's life, something clicked in his mind, and David dealt with clinical depression. And maybe if you deal with it like I have dealt with it in my life, if you want to go to a book from someone who experiences depression, go to the book of Psalms. And here's a guy who is suffering from depression, who is going to God, begging for relief. David lost sight of the fact that not too many months earlier, Samuel, the prophet of God, poured oil down his head and said, surely you will be the next king of Israel. But in this moment in David's life, he can't see it. He cannot see the good vision that God has for him. But Jonathan grabs him by the cheeks and looks him straight in the eye. And he says, David, you are not going to die. I see the good vision that God has for you. You're going to be the next king of Israel. David, I will do whatever it takes to make sure the vision that I see in you comes to fruition. What does it mean to sacrificially and unconditionally love somebody? Write this third principle down. This is a good one. I help them see God's good vision for them. Do you have someone in your life that truly believes in you, that can see God's good vision even when you don't? And at times they have to grab you by the cheeks, look you in the eye and say, you are not surely going to die. You are going to make it. God's good vision is going to be accomplished in your life. Don't give up. I will do whatever it takes to make sure the vision of God comes to fruition in your life. Then I ask the follow up question. Are you that kind of person, that kind of Jonathan for somebody else, someone who has lost sight of the good vision, maybe they're in a time of challenge by the design of God and you grab them by the cheek and say, listen up, I still see the good vision that God has for you. Okay, one more. Did you notice at the very beginning of the relationship that Jonathan does something that we might not fully grasp in our culture, but it is huge? So I'm gonna go back to 1 Samuel 18 and we'll look at three again and then I want to add on verse four. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. In verse four, Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. We don't understand this in our culture, but when Jonathan, at the beginning of their relationship, took off his royal robe and he placed it on David, he was acknowledging to David that he understood that David would be the next king of Israel and he would not. Later, when his dad ordered the death of David, Jonathan once again objects and says to his dad, 1 Samuel chapter 20, beginning in verse 30, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. Isn't that funny? When the kid goes bad, they blame the woman. You know, that's good. Not my son. 
Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. I mean, Jonathan knew that Saul is really kind of being a good dad. Saul wants the best for his son, and he wants to protect his legacy. He wants his son to be the next rightful king of Israel. The truth is, I'd really like to be king. You know, all I want is a kind word, a warm bed, and unlimited power. Wouldn't that be just so awesome? Later, when Saul is still tracking David down as a fugitive, Jonathan and David meet up briefly, and Jonathan says this to David in 1 Samuel 23. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel. Now look at this. And I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. What does it mean to sacrificially and unconditionally love others? I want you to write this final principle down. This is the biggest of all. I sacrifice my rights to see them succeed. I sacrifice my rights to see them succeed. A person who truly loves is willing to give up their rights, their happiness, their goals, and their dreams. They're willing to lay it down to see the other person succeed. <laughs> You've gotta be asking at this point, particularly those of you who are maybe new, you say, is that kind of love even possible? I mean, this, is, this has got to be a fairy tale. This cannot be a true story. No, this is a true story, and this kind of love is, in fact, available today for those who've yielded their life to Jesus. And we have had several sightings of this, actually, within the West Side families, several sightings, but I wanted to pick one particular story of a Jonathan-David relationship found in a couple by the name of Gary and Vicki. Turn your attention to the screen and watch their story unfold. MS itself, a lot of times, is not that bad. I just happen to have the kind that's paralyzing and real bad and quadriplegic. So I needed Vicki more than I knew. We dated for four years, got married in 1971. We had our daughter in 1972, and that's when we started noticing uh, MS symptoms. I, I never would have known when we got married how important, how important Vicki would be to me. It, it continues to be that way. He's a really, really neat guy. I'm glad to have him. Probably five years ago, uh, that Vicki, she just screamed out with pain. And I put him in bed and I went to push his bed and my back snapped. And I mean, it, it, it hurt, it hurt a lot. They ran some tests on her, did some blood work, and they came back and they told Vicki that she had cancer. I've known Gary for probably 40 years at least. Uh, we both worked down at Procter & Gamble. Haven't seen Rudy for a few years once I went on disability and quit working. And after that, lo and behold, we met at Westside. Didn't have a clue that we were going to the same church. And uh, it just kind of evolved from that. I had no idea how much, uh, how much help that he would be giving us. Uh, he comes up on Sunday morning, Rudy's an early riser, gets me dressed. We've got a lift, he gets me out of bed, throws me in my wheelchair, and we go to church. So that's, that's how it started. Just started coming up and, and trying to take some of the load off of Vicki because she was trying to, you know, chemo kicks your butt. So the church, sent people over with food and they'd come every other night. So and Rudy and Kathy were in the rotation. And without really being in a life group and having those connections, 
I don't know what I would have done without them. I mean, they were just the sweetest group of people and how we all intertwined and got so close because of our illnesses and stuff like that. If I hurt, they hurt. And if I needed something, they were there right there to do it. And we were really blessed. We had, we had the neatest group. She has just laid her life down to be there for Gary. Uh, made so many sacrifices for him, and, and she's always upbeat about it. She has never complained. I have never heard her complain. I've been up here when she was so sick, she couldn't hold her head up, and she would get up and go and take care of Gary. Uh, Vicki had been dealing with this for 30, 40 years, so what I've done is, is nothing compared to what she has done and, and what a lot of other people have done also. I, I have no idea what it would be like without Vic. Uh, gosh, I don't know that I've even thought about that much. He's my best friend. He's, um, he's funny. Uh, he's an irritation. He's been a great dad to our kids. Uh, he was a really good husband to me. If I had this to do all over again, I'd do it. Uh, I can't imagine being married to anybody else. God's just always been right there taking care of us. So it's, it's been a good life. People think I'm crazy when I say that, but it has, it really has. Gary and Vicki, much like many of you, in 1971, they stood at an altar in a church and they shared their vows for better, for worse, in sickness and in health. And they got one year of better, one year of health, and 47 years of sickness, 47 years of worth. But did you hear what Vicki said? She said, uh, He's my best friend. She said, um, I would do it all over again. We have a great life. In the middle of the journey, she gets cancer. You would think this would be the opportunity for her to say, I'm out. And you heard testimony, even in the midst of extreme pain, she laid it all down for her husband and they experienced joy. It's interesting, uh, when David was fleeing, he would see Jonathan one more time before, as you fast forward the story, Jonathan is found dead on the battlefield being faithful to his father Saul. And they met up one more time, and here's what we're told, 1 Samuel 20. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Why, of course, he did. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much today for the beautiful picture of David and Jonathan. And we thank you now for the Jonathans in our life. And boy, God, we're going to let them know today how much we appreciate them sacrificing and laying down their lives, seeing the good vision in us, advocating for us, covenanting with us. And Father, we also in this moment come and pray that you would give us the strength and the courage from the inside out through your Holy Spirit to be a Jonathan to just a handful of people that you put in our life. Would you do that for us? And right now in this very holy moment, we think of Jesus Christ, the ultimate Jonathan, who sacrificially and unconditionally loved us when we were so unlovable and so in this moment, we come to this feast and we take a piece of bread and we take a cup representing Jesus who so sacrificed his life unconditionally for us that we now have a good vision unstoppable before us. We enter into this feast with great honor. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said,